Hello, and welcome to EPR with your favorite environmental nerds, Nick and Laura. On today's episode, Nick and I discuss my adventures in Puerto Rico. We talk to Juan Ravallo about Urban Land Institute, Biodiversity, and Biomimicry. And finally, in honor of Juan's very amusing story about crabs, here are some fun facts <laughs> about crabs. <laughs> <laughs> totally lost my place. <laughs> Oh, okay. And finally, in honor of Juan's very amusing story about crabs, here are some fun facts about crabs. The smallest crab is the pea crab, which is about a half an inch in diameter. And comparably, the Japanese spider crab is the world's largest up to 13, what? 13 feet? Yeah. 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 I checked. 13 feet across. Okay. Its, it's head is okay. bigger than your head. I will be going body. to pictures after this. It's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. It is the stuff of nightmares and no one will be traveling to the depths of the ocean to find them. I don't know. I got to look on the internet though. It's, oof. It <laughs> is, it's from a horror movie. Say that again. It's from a horror movie. It's absolutely from a horror movie. It is like somebody was like designed it to be the scariest thing you've ever seen. Yeah. Have you ever seen that little crab? I forget what it's called. It looks like it's wearing a little hat. No. I will have to find this for you. <laughs> Crab with a hat. I'm looking it up. Yes. <laughs> Last but not least, a group of crabs is called a cast. Cast of crabs. Yeah, because they wear hats and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Hit that music. We are working with Sierra Talaferro over at the Green Obsidian to highlight a few of the individuals that she is highlighting for our Black History Month. Today, we want to introduce you to Nelson Holland, who is a New York native and now a full-blown Colorado hiker and TikTok sensation who's known for his account at Fat, Black, and Getting It to start sharing his hiking journey experiences with others to hopefully connect to a larger community of similar people with common interests that also advocate for more inclusive outdoors. Check him out on TikTok. Don't forget to check out Sierra's Green Obsidian on Facebook or LinkedIn. You are not off the hook for the 30-second comedy sponsor spot. Okay. <clears throat> let me, yeah, give me the timer. Let me go. Yep. Let me know when you're ready. Ready. Go. Okay, guys. Are you tired of being outdoors and wishing you could be inside? Don't worry. The new indoors is out indoors. You can take outside. It's great. It's wonderful. It's got this uh, this nice, soft, very thin layer at the bottom that you. It's almost like you're sleeping exactly on the ground because you are. Um, it's got this. You know, this nice thing. You, you're gonna. You're gonna. You're gonna. You know, tie to the ground and it's got the zip thing to stop people from, uh, you know, from mosquitoes from getting in. It's super great. It's definitely not a tent. I know that's what you're thinking, but it's not. It's definitely not. It's it's, it's indoors. That's what we're calling it. Um, and yeah, it's great. It's wonderful. And uh, no matter what we say, uh, this thing will sleep three people, even though it seems like it wouldn't. You didn't say how tall or big the people were. It'll it'll sleep three. I'm telling you indoors. That's what we're doing. That's what it's called. Look it up today. Indoors.com. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, so close. Oh, <laughs> oh good. Let's get to our segment. <laughs> right. <laughs> Wait, why are you going to Puerto Rico? For my friend Carrie's and my birthday. Didn't you just go to Hawaii? I did. Are you trying to do all of the same cool stuff? Is that what you're trying to do? Just, just cram it all in. Yep. This is the year of just whatever. <laughs> year of whatever. I like that. Where are you going in Puerto Rico? We're going to San Juan and we're staying in a Airbnb down there just for the weekend. So we'll just probably walk around a lot and then check out some rainforest and uh, hike a little bit. Do you have a car? We did not rent a car yet. I think we were going to try to just Uber. They do have Uber. So we're going to. If you stay in San Juan, absolutely not a problem to do that. It is, like I say, the, the roads are challenging to drive there, but not, it's a pretty bad, aggressive driving city or area, I guess. But I was only asking because the bioluminescent bay, the one that I did is about mm. an hour and change from San Juan. So that's in Fajardo. And there's three different ones and they're all a little bit different. What's the bay called? Uh, well, the town's called Fajardo. And that's the closest one to San Juan. There's a better one on Vieques, but it's the best one, you know, one of the best ones in the world. But it it was still really cool. I really enjoyed the bio bay and, and for Hardo. So take a look if you're there on the King Tide, it'll be even better. 
mm-hmm. and you really should just go and get your Harry Potter on basically. So <laughs> do you like go in a boat or you just walk in the water? Uh, you kayak and you have to kayak out and there's like two people per, I think they were all tandems, which is a little frustrating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, well, we mean, you're not my boyfriend, so it'll be fine. Yeah. So yeah. Speaking of field stories, that was the one where the guy, the two guys in front of us couldn't stay straight. On their kayak to save their <laughs> lives. It was, I wish I had a camera. It was so funny. And you're just like, guys, forward, not left or right. And they'd be going fine. They'd boom. <laughs> That's because Look dudes always try to take the lead, even when they're in the front. Yeah. <laughs> always. And they, and they were trying to like muscle their way through. I'm like, you yes. don't have to, you don't, you don't paddle harder when you're doing it wrong. You just become right. more wrong. You, you, <laughs> you have to, you have to adjust subtly, you know, to get back to the center. And it was just, they must have done like 10 miles worth of paddling. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Anyway, but still, you should go there. It, it would be really cool. If you can, you know, if you only have a weekend, maybe not, but like, it's worth going to. What else you got? Oh, for Puerto Rico? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> eat the food, talk to the locals, try to talk in Spanish. They call beans abichuelas instead of frijoles. That's a mistake. Oh. That, that's funny. Uh, what do they call it? Abichuelas. Oh, gosh. Yeah, there's no way you can remember that. that. <laughs> it's impossible. I'm just like frijoles, and they're like every time, like we know you're not from here. We know what those are, but no, mm, it's abichuelas. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know why. I have no idea that I asked around. And then uh, while I was there, last time I was there too, because I was like, I need to figure out how this happened. And they're like, oh, who knows? <laughs> but uh, I thought that was pretty funny. Just to, I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of like you know, in England, uh, trunk of your car is a boot, and here it's a trunk. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Just to be different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. It's a, uh, yeah, you'll have fun. You'll have to talk about how, what it's like when you come back. Yeah. San Juan's a good time. You can Uber on there. No problem though. Yeah. I carry travels a lot. I was really surprised she hadn't been there already. Yeah. It's a very unique, very unique spot. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. This <laughs> segment is going nowhere. <laughs> yeah, no, it isn't. <laughs> you have to come back and then we'll finish it. <laughs> that could be interesting. Never done that before. No. So, Laura, <laughs> tell us about Puerto Rico. How was it? Puerto Rico was awesome. I don't think it was quite the adventure that I had uh, anticipated just because Carrie and I were both super busy before we went. And so we didn't make any plans in advance. So we had our Airbnb, which was perfectly located, like right in the middle of Old San Juan. And um, oh, perfect. Yeah. they were like, well, maybe we'll get to the rainforest. Maybe we'll do the bioluminescent bay like we talked about <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. they kind of require reservations <laughs> and uh-huh. <laughs> a driver yeah. or a rental car or something and we were just yeah. like okay we're here <laughs> um which was totally fine so it was a walking eating weekend where we just really yeah. spent most of our time checking out san juan and old san juan but we walked there's a whole walking sidewalk that goes the whole like beach side of San Juan. And we walked pretty far along that. And then we went to, we took a Uber to the only, the only brewery on the Island I really could see was ocean lab. And that venue was really cool. It was like the brewery was attached to a concert venue, which was attached to uh, the pool side of a hotel directly on the beach. Um, mm-hmm. And they had to close early for a show and it was winger. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. Oh, I wanted to stay so bad, but it didn't start till past my bedtime. So I was like, <laughs> oh, <that's funny. laughs> not staying. Yeah. It's also really expensive, man. I don't know how people can go to concerts anymore. Oh, I know that is, yeah. They, they're astronomical in price these days. But yeah. I mean, when you were in Puerto Rico, did you do same old San Juan? Like, I mean, I, so I've been a couple of times, but I've always also, usually I've had to get out of San Juan. I haven't spent a ton of time there. I have spent time, but I had to see, I've gotten to see uh, a lot of the island. And that's actually really, really fun. It was really cool. I think Ponce is really great. I think, like I say, Fajardo in the Bay is really cool. I'm sad that you guys didn't get to do it. But well, it was also, so part of our decision there too was it was a full moon and that's oh, yeah. really the best time to go. So we were like, let's not jump through the hoops to really, you know, get there and then kind of be disappointed. So yeah. And if you don't have like, it's like a full moon works. If there's a king tide, you can still, they actually have tarps that they put over top of you, but like you has to be like perfect conditions on a full moon and that's tough. Yeah. So 
we got really lucky on ours. But yeah, new moon's the best time to go. New moon on the king tide is, they say it's literal magic. So, I mean, I agree. I could say even when we went, the moon was up, but it was still, it was king tide. It was, it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, if I, I took your advice. I looked at the tide. It was kind of like in the middle somewhere and then full moon. Yeah, I was like, it's no good. No good. Um, yeah. So, you know, informed decisions. <laughs> right. Right. And really just, you know, it was a lesson in just like, let's just go with the flow. We didn't, yeah. you know nothing on either one of us. Neither one of us had time to plan. We're here. Let's just enjoy what we got. And there's plenty of opportunity to eat and walk around and see stuff. And yeah. so we just did that. Yeah. And as long as you're not driving, it's an absolutely delightful place to be. Yes. It's a <laughs> fair, fair, fair thing. But you no, know, I, I mean, San Juan is really cool. I've still gotten to enjoy some of, but you know, some of it too, you know, and there's a lot of expats all over the place in San Juan too. There's a lot of people all over, very welcoming city very very yeah, the fun. first couple of days it was you know not too crowded then the cruise ship came in and it was you know a whole different world yeah yep and then you got to find like, <laughs> they're all going to the same four bars and yeah it was funny i was actually at a bar there and the bartender looked exactly like a friend of mine so we were just having a conversation <laughs> and i'm like is this ben is this you know no and he but like he was like while I was there, they were trying to get on a cruise lines list for cocktails. And so he had to create like two different cocktails for one of the cruise lines. And this woman came and sat there and, and took the, you know, was, it was reviewing basically his two cocktails that he made. And she loved the first one and he had to make an edit to the second. And I'm like listening to this and I'm like, man, this, a lot is riding on this one woman's opinion on, on the drink. Right. It's pretty wild. It was pretty funny to see. I was like, oh. I mean, it makes sense, right? <laughs> they want to know it's good before they send people there, but very funny. Um, yeah. Just a part of the business. Oh, and I just loved that it's a cat-friendly city. I was probably yeah. all kinds of environmentally wrong, but <laughs> I had no idea. So we would like turn this one corner and it was just like cat crossing and cats everywhere. And I think, I don't know how many cats I probably walked by before I realized that they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, but I loved it. I just wanted to sit down in a park and just chill out with cats all day. I know. Right. Yeah. And they, they would let you, um, yeah. but yeah, it's a really great place. I'm glad you had fun. Next I mean, like I bring treats. What's that? what's that? I'm bringing treats next time. Oh yeah. <laughs> like if I knew all these cats were here, I would definitely have treats in my pocket. There you go. Oh, that's funny. But yeah, so that's, it, that's the takeaway. If you visit old San Juan, bring some cat treats. There we go. <laughs> That's a good spot to end it. <laughs> Life advice from EPR, ring cat trees. <laughs> Let's get to our interview. Welcome back to EPR. Today we have Juan Ravallo, Senior Ecologist and Nature-Based Solutions Strategist at Jacobs on the show. Welcome, Juan. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Awesome. So we've had a few other guests from Jacobs on here, namely Michelle Rao and Holly Schmidt, and we're always impressed with their knowledge and the work that they do. And so we first want to start off with asking you what's entailed in your role at Jacobs. I am a senior ecologist and I support different components of projects that have an ecological element into it. I work with different teams with the water market in California with the landscape and design in other places of the nation. This nature-based solutions strategies piece is my, I would say like my mission to bring this ecological intelligence into every project that I have the opportunity to work in. I believe that it has a working with nature instead of against nature, it's important. I think it's the only way to go, <laughs> to move into the, the mm -hmm. future. And it has a great, power of regeneration and resilience and adaptation and well-being and it cross over so many areas that as society we need to improve yeah so yeah i i mean i work in many different projects but all of them has this component of ecology bringing into it awesome when we were talking earlier, you, you said that you were, and I love your enthusiasm for the work, but also for the exact work that Jacobs is doing. And you mentioned that you really liked the direction that they were going and the types of projects that they were getting. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Like how long have you been with Jacobs and, and are you seeing like a different direction or just sort of momentum in a certain direction that you're liking? Um, yes. I mean, I think that, I mean, we are living the greatest challenge with climate change and the loss of biodiversity and many other things. 
probably the biggest challenge of our generation that we are living right now. And at the same time, it's the biggest opportunity to do something about it and engage meaningfully. I was working before in another great company as well called Biohabitat. That they do amazing work. And I was invited to join Jacobs because the momentum of what's happening, it's also very interesting. The size of this company, the reach, the scale of projects, the type of clients, it's in a scale that I believe it's important to participate in working and improving it as best as I can, you know. So yeah, the core of the strategy of Jacobs, there's series of sustainability goals and a climate action and a climate response accelerator, it's called. And at the core of that is this idea that we are directly dependent on nature as a society. Probably half of the GDP is dependent on nature. And the state of these nature and ecosystems is very dire right now. We are in the, facing the sixth extinction rate. We cannot pretend that that is not related to us. That is not related to our economy, to our health, to our potential. We cannot pretend anymore that that is happening in an environmental sphere separated from what people do, from what people depend on, not only for work, but for life. Yeah. And I believe that that is at the core of the strategy that Jacobs is leading now. We just started with a new CEO, which is fantastic. And he has been working also with this team, putting together this strategy. So working, I mean, many clients nowadays are asking for this kind of approach. Some clients specifically are asking how, okay, this is great. Engineering, design, it will function as we believe. Now, how can we enhance biodiversity? And that is something that didn't happen before. <laughs> you know, this is starting to happen more and more. And there's many, many different, I would say, indicators of different groups that are shifting in that direction. And that fills me with hope and enthusiasm to participate, for sure. Great. Are there any specific projects that kind of illustrate that or anything that you could talk about just to kind of give us some feeling for the actual work? Yeah. I mean, one is the, the work, for example, that Hollywood uh, talked to you guys before with a partnership with engineering with nature and the work in some Department of Defense facilities in which they are leading the way to engineering with nature. That means raising the resiliency and the readiness of those facilities through the restoration and through the use, intentional restoration, I would say, of the ecosystems that surround the bases or the facilities in terms of reducing the risk of flooding or different regards, which is fantastic because the Army Corps of Engineers in the past, you wouldn't say that it's the best example of ecosystem restoration, you know? In the past, they, I mean, they are heavy-footed engineers, but now this group that is emerging strongly of engineering with nature, it's actually changing that perspective and bringing amazing, amazing results. So that is one that it's fantastic that that is happening. But here, for example, in, in California, Jacobs participated in the updating of the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan that was just adopted probably last week. And that is very important because it really, really touches the Central Valley probably is the most productive area in the U.S. Yeah. And it's the home of millions of people. And California is a state that has more endangered species. So a lot of things are happening on the same space. And this flood protection plan, it touches agriculture, of course, the flood protection, recreation, the protection for families and cities. But at the same time, part of the recommendations is, a, is the use of nature-based solutions. The quest to achieve multiple objective solutions, activities that actually accomplish many things at the same time. So instead of having conservation fighting against agriculture, the recommendation is, OK, how we can make both things. And it happens that rice fields are great, provide certain features that are great for the one of the very endangered species here in California, the giant garter snake. And things like that, you know, how can we accomplish both goals? How can we have win-wins in this approach? And, and it's happening. People are supporting it and projects are emerging in that direction. So it's fantastic. 
I have also smaller projects that doesn't deal with a multi-county <laughs> statewide <laughs> approach. Um, but some clients are not only looking to enhance biodiversity, but they are also asking questions like, how can we enhance biodiversity, work with native species, but at the same time manage stormwater and at the same time improve air quality? Right. How can we filter a sediment to approach our processes and you know how can we provide cooling without the use of refrigerants how can we stack functions how can we nature support this deep integration of design and ecology so it's fantastic to work in those projects because it's a big innovation approach in which nature is not something that you carve a little piece on the side and you say that is nature, the rest is not, <laughs> right. you know, right. that right. happens all the time. <laughs> you know? oh, yeah. So it's interesting to bring this forward and see it happen. And clients really, really trying to do it. I mean, sometimes I can imagine things that the clients say, well, no, that is too far away. You know, we are not do doing that. Right. But at the same time, they're saying, but that is interesting. That is interesting. Let's move for that one, you know, and, and it's happening. So. I have worked in this approach with a client in Arizona, in California, in Washington, and now there's another one that we are working in the in New York, in the state of New York. So it's, it's happening, you know, it's happening. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that too, because it's kind of like, you know, we've been talking for years about, okay, well, if you build, if you get rid of a wetland and you build something on top of it, that's where all the water goes. It's wet for a reason, right? There's a reason it's wet. And so... right you know, building smarter, not harder. And I love the messaging there. So how does that tie into what you do, the work that you've done with the uh, Urban Land Institute? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. Well, we participated in the in the production of this report, and I happen to have it open here. It's Nature Positive and Net Zero, the ecology of real estate. So Nature Positive, Net Zero, it's a little bit more common language nowadays in the environmental consultancy and sustainability arena, right? Net zero. But nature positive is an emerging field. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that the attention to reduce carbon emissions to kind of tackle climate change is super important. It's crucial that we do it as fast as possible. But we are forgetting the, the biodiversity piece. Yeah, There's not such a market yet. You know, there's there are different approaches on biodiversity, but there's not like a big consensus of how we do it. And Nature Positive, the IUCN started talking about Nature Positive in the last COP27. And then the, the Biodiversity Convention also brought it forward. And it's starting to gain momentum, you know, not only in the U.S. that luckily we were able to join the world in tackling these challenges, but also in many other places of the world, the UK, for example, have this biodiversity metric that all projects need to need to prove that they are raising the biodiversity metric with their own project. So they have a process to evaluate the baseline. They have a process to evaluate from the baseline when the project is built, how the biodiversity will suffer, will diminish. But then they need to integrate features that prove that it will raise at least 10% from the previous baseline. And that is fantastic, you know, the biodiversity metric. It seems that it's going to be mandatory at some point in this year. And there are some clients of Jacobs that they are already asking, okay, what do we do? How does that look? Yeah. How can we do it? And the nature positive, the ecology of real estate, Actually, the, this report with the Urban Land Institute make the case not only of the importance of why we need to do this, you know, why it's important to solve this issue, but also how, or at least initially, some degree of strategy at different levels. So we talk about the portfolio level in which a campus is being made or a portfolio across the globe. There are some companies that have property, real estate all over the world. And those companies have a big influence of what they can do across the board. But there are some people that have um, companies that are concerned about their campus or the single building, or even just talk about certain materials, the material selection, the procurement, you know, the life cycle and different strategies. So that report pretty much 
uses this approach of nature positive to talk about all these issues at different scales. And it was really cool. People from the Green Print, the ULI participated in, in this, people from Jacobs, but also from Len Lee's, Prologis, and other companies that, that manage real estate or environmental people. So it gathers the kind of the group intelligence to talk about this issue. How can we really leverage ecology and have also a business case in the real estate industry? Yeah. And it's really, that's fascinating. That's really, really fascinating. And I was wondering, like, could you maybe talk about what some of those biodiversity features that companies can add? Like, what would those be? Like an example of one. Yeah. For example, the project that I was working with this client in both in Arizona and California, we started to understanding where the project is located. Where is it sitting? Where is the property at? But instead of starting to think of the project from the fence to the inside, what I do is to, first of all, look what it's outside. Where is that project nested, right? I need to understand what is the bigger ecoregion that is nesting this site. What are the soils over there? What is the story, the ecological, big ecosystem story of that area? So I work with the at least level four ecoregional approach. And then I dig a little bit deeper and I try to see what is happening right now outside this property and, and what is the history of that place. So in a project in Washington State, well, it was uh, the floodplain of the Duwamish and then it was transformed into agriculture and then it was transformed into an industrial area. And then nowadays it's a parking lot, you know, <laughs> and probably it was in the past a brownfield, you know. Yeah. Okay. But that means that some certain legacies are still there. Not only the recent legacy of the pollution, but also the legacy of the forest and the wetlands and also the hydrology that still the water still run through it, you know. So we, we, I start narrowing down the understanding of what this place is not only looking to the past, not trying to kind of to return to that state, you know, in certain moments, it's impossible to return to that state. So there is a usual, a common critique. And it's not that, that the restoration doesn't try to, it's not trying to do that. And in the words of Keith Bowers, the, the founder of Biohabitat, what we are trying, I mean, we're looking at the past to see what used to work over there. What were the forces and the energies that shaped that place? But not to return to that moment. We are restoring the future. We're mm -hmm. thinking about the future and the potential of that site into the future. And thinking of that potential then, you try to integrate the project, what the project needs, but also that ecological potential into it and what functions can work with each other. So not only the what kind of structure of habitat we need to have in terms of vertical structure of species on the ground, species on the understory, trees or elemental or open, or, or if it's more like um, hydric soils or wetlands, what kind of species are there. But then from there, we need to understand also what other species are in the region, use the region, and might use this little spot that we are recreating as a stepping stone, right? Sometimes the projects are, in this case, for example, in Washington, is very near to the riparian corridors, you know? Yeah. So can we participate intentionally in that corridor? Can we promote connectivity? Can we create shelter, food sources, refugia to different species that we know that they are there? You know, mm -hmm. not talking about the rats and the cities, you know, and the <laughs> kind of, <laughs> but talking about wildlife, right? Yeah. Sometimes the wildlife in the urban cores are already disappeared, but sometimes the pollinators are still there. Sometimes even woodpeckers are still there or other animals, right? In the Washington area, I used to live near Seattle in the other side towards the Kitsap Peninsula, and you could see bald eagles oh, yeah. going around. And you could see ospreys having a nest in the towers. or So the, there's a lot of wildlife that is surviving the encroachment that we do with our expansion. So how, and this is another phrase from uh, this biologist called Leo Wilson, how can we tackle this? I mean, expansion and stewardship, they usually are perceived as opposing goals. Yeah. 
And the real key to this conundrum is how can we use this approach to nature in a way that it reshape and reinforce the other one? Yeah. Yeah. How expansion reinforces st stewardship, how stewardship reinforces expansion. That doesn't mean that we need to expand to everywhere. You know, we need to preserve <laughs> wildlife as such and, and, and give space for that. But the expansion and, the dis and, and then it is a question of design. How can we design to do this? It's a design challenge. Yeah. And then we can talk with architects, with engineers, with developers, with et cetera, you know. So it's bringing different layers of consideration into the design process. That one approach that includes all species, not only the car and the human that is associated to the car. Yeah. You exactly. know? Yeah, exactly. But, but the rest of the species, and not only from the fence in, but also from the fence out. Right. You know, and, and then it could be very interesting because some people are starting to bring into this equation not only the function of the site and the ecology of the site, but also the people of the site. Yeah. So who used to be there and who is there now? Yeah. So how can we promote interaction with the neighbors? How can we be a good neighbor? And this approach not only will bring value to the project, but also may facilitate dialogues with the neighboring community and may also facilitate dialogues with the regulatory agencies and may all that benefit the process of the project itself. Yeah. I mean, so... Yeah. It gives like genuine ownership to the community that's involved as well. That's right. And in some cases, it can be very direct and very intimate, you know? Yeah. And so it's funny, you mentioned all that. It's just, you know, sparking all kinds of things. Like, I think another aspect of this has to do with biomimicry, too. So it's not even... Oh, yeah. There's lots of other things. And, and you are a certified biomimicry professional from the Biomimicry Institute, which... That is right. You got your master's in it, which is really, really cool. That's... <laughs> Is that it, is right. It's using strategies in nature to solve human problems. So how, did, how on earth did you get into that? Like where, and how does that fit into what you're doing? Well, it's a big piece of what, what I do. I mean, I want to say that everything that I do starts with a key question in biomimicry, which is how would nature do it? Right. You know, you, you have this challenge, this design challenge, this function that you need to solve for. Key question is, okay, how would nature do that? Yeah. And it's not how would nature would design a cooling tower. It's how would nature cool, right? Right. It's not how would nature create a strong barrier against the seawall, against the ocean. It's how would nature manages the energy of the waves. Right. So it's not exactly how would nature do exactly what you think you want to do, like a seawall. Is how nature manages that same challenge that you try to solve usually with a seawall. Right, yeah. And then it's incredible the approach that that kind of conversation triggers with architects and engineers that are a little bit open to have that discussion because they start having much more, a bigger ideation space. Yeah. They can see the shapes, they can see the the interaction of things. They can see the value of having that, you know, and instead of having a seawall. So the reason that I got into this is because I was living in Mexico several years ago. And as an ecologist and biologist, I, I was working before in laboratories. I was making basic research. That's what we do, right? We go and <laughs> we study, we think, look things into the minute, and then probably we write a paper and present in a Congress and look for the next one. But I was born in a family of designers and artists, I will say. So all the conversations and family trips, we were lucky to, to go to places in which my dad as an architect will explore the architecture, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then carve a little bit of time for me to have some nature exposure, you know? But then I learned a lot of this. And after being in science, in this kind of basic science and research for a while, I grew a little bit frustrated to see how little the basic science was actually preventing the destruction of our natural world. Yeah. Because developers don't read papers. Right. And sometimes in some countries, environmental regulations don't really work as well as in other places. That is the case of Mexico and many other countries, you know. 
so I started doing something else. And finally, we, me and, and a couple of friends founded a company in which they were designers and I was the ecologist and we were trying to do projects together. So we started working with master planning groups, with architects, with engineers. And then I received a call from a good friend asking if I would like to participate as a local ecologist to a new thing that was a new team that was coming to Mexico to work with a university of biomimicry. And they needed a local ecologist. And the fact that I was already working with designers, it was like a big discovery, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, I joined that and we went to this major trip in which we were bringing basically designers and, and business people to explore experience directly different ecosystems and understand uh, some part of the, I would say, like wisdom or knowledge that is embedded in those species and in those places, right? Yeah. And in Mexico, you can experience 13 ecosystems in one single day, you know, just yeah. go from the mountain to the ocean, you know, and you have, yeah, yeah. so it's fantastic. And then the two-year certification so middles were was open and I applied and I was accepted and and I just got into it and and for me it was already already something that I was resonating deeply this idea of multidisciplinarity between science and ecology with design and engineering and business you know so after I studied biology I studied an MBA just to understand a little bit of how the world works right. <laughs> beyond the laboratory and so all this combination is something that I was already experiencing biomimicry with B38 and the lead of Janine and Dana and everybody over there helped me very significantly in shaping and structuring it and understanding, oh, this is not just a crazy idea. This is a, a main idea that has the potential to change the world. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a great, great thing. I use it all the time in everything I do. And like, you know, it's, it, you mentioned seawalls earlier and like, I think that's fascinating. We're like, oh, well, we'll just build a wall and that'll be the, the solution. And then you start looking at what nature does. It's like, how about we just slow it down and, you know, use, you know, seagrass and right. uh, and do all this. It's uh, less expensive and whatever it is, you know, it's just, it's a lot easier to do. You don't have to maintain it over. And just that creativity is yeah. really, really unique and really, really cool. And so I'm really <laughs> glad that you're seeing that in a lot of what you do. Well, now, now the nature-based solutions approach uh, promoted in the IUCN and, and in the kind of global arena as well, it's exactly that, you know, it's how can we work with nature instead of extracting the minerals from nature and then make a seawall that we need to repair every five years. It's very powerful. And I truly believe that that is this approach, the evolution of this approach is the only way forward that we have as humanity. Yeah. If we can actually align with those processes, I think that that's the only way forward. Climate action, social justice, health, you know, abundance, yeah. everything, it's already there. And we cannot have the luxury of allowing it to go extinct because mm -hmm. there's no way that we can recreate it. You know, extinction is forever. That is yes. not a cliche. It's real. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really great point. And I want to ask you, since you've been able to, you know, your work's taken you all over the world, which is really, really cool. So you have a really unique perspective, I think, on the way that we're, you know, tackling this challenge all over. Um, yeah. I guess, where was the first place that you went overseas to work and how has that influenced? Uh, how yeah. Has that experience influenced you? I couldn't say that is the first but it was very revealing, um, the opportunity that I had of going and working in Bhutan, which is in the northeast of India, between India and China, right? And it was a very remote area. It was the end of the road in the base of the Himalayas, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Such an amazing, amazing spot. I was working, I was subcontracted by the National, it's called uh, National Gross, Gross Happiness Index Center. Because Bhutan is one of the few countries that they don't have a GDP, a gross, usually gross internal product. They have a gross happiness index. So they mention not only the productivity, but mention a whole set of indicators of how people are happy or not. That implies health, education, income, access to schools, communication, 
it's an interesting indicator. They were building a center and, and I was uh, fortunate to uh, being asked if I wanted to go and make a site assessment for them because it was just in the border of a protected area, a very important protected area, and they wanted to know how to approach it. And what was very revealing to me is that even there, in the, this remote village in Bumtang, is a, is a municipality over there, where the road ends, you know, mm -hmm. one of the main concerns that I discovered over there, that is nothing to be discovered, but I, it was a realization to me. It was that the, the center, it was being planned to be very close, a big river that comes down from the Himalayas. But nowadays, the big risk over there, it's called Gulf Glacier Lake Outburst Flood. Oh, yeah. So you have the glaciers over there in the Himalayas that are melting. And now we have glacier lakes. But the lake has a big berm that is actually keeping the water in the lake. And it's it, it just a trickle that creates a river, which is not a trickle. It's a big, big river. But the problem is that you have big chunks of ice and mountain aside the glacier that are also melting. So when this thing melts enough and slide into the lake, they create such a wave that destroys the berm. And in one big event, all the lake can just flood the whole basin. Yeah. And you can imagine all the agriculture happens around the river and the main towns are around the river. And if that happens, well, it's bringing big trees with the water and it can be a catastrophe. So I researched a little bit more and I talked to a Japanese scientist that studied this and we talked for a little while. And, and so the, not only my recommendation to that project was to the kind of vegetation, how to promote the ecology, the landscape ecology and all of this, but also how to prevent and prepare for that kind of event. Yeah. So early warning systems make a study of elevation, you know, I mean, how to position structures. And my suggestion was not to be in the floodplain, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which seems like obvious, but the main right. project was in the floodplain. So it's, it's not obvious sometimes, you know? Right, of course. Sometimes we love floodplains because it's flat, it's nice, it's yeah, near yeah. the river. This is and so as you said, it will flood. Yeah. <laughs> right. But in this case, I mean, it's not going to flood peacefully. It's going to flood catastrophically. So that needs to be into consideration. So the very thing that it was very revealing to me is that what I was looking in urban places in Mexico or in the U.S., South America, it's happening everywhere, even in the very base of the Himalayas. I mean, Bhutan has almost 60% of the whole territory is preserved area, is conservation area, it's beautiful. And even there, all the global dynamic is happening in a way that we need to be responding to it. We need to talk about adaptation and resilience, even in remote areas like that. So for me, that was, what, that was very, very revealing. And I realized that Adaptation and resilience is to be in the core of everything that we do. Yeah. Everything that we produce and everything that we think about as humans should be going in that direction. I think yeah. that we should have started like 50 years ago, at least, <laughs> you know? Right. And we are still kind of saying, oh, but it's a, such an incommod I mean, uncomfortable topic. Let's leave it for later. It's like, no, there's no later, you know? This, yeah. We need to make it happen now. And I'm not naive. I mean, things need to keep on. We need jobs, we need income, we need health, we need education, we need everything that we are doing, but we need to direct it in this direction. And I'm convinced with that. And and probably that, I mean, the other one was working in Morocco. And this project was a big, big, big thing. And we have the opportunity to talk to people. And it was very interesting because they told us, don't, don't tell me that we are doing things wrong. We already know. You don't need to come here and point fingers and try to create some guilt, you know. We already know. Don't, yeah. don't, don't tell me that. Tell me how to do it right. Yeah. That's what I want to know. Right. Yeah, and it's like, yeah. okay, that is fantastic. I mean, I wish everybody had that kind of perspective, you know. Yeah. And, and perspective is really important. I think a lot of times, instead of seeing it as a fight, is, you know, seeing it as a coming together. You know, it's it's not you're doing this wrong, it's how can we do this smarter for everyone? And you can even say words like save money 
And they yep. go, wait, we can do this and save money. That, that's a thing that can happen. You're like, yes, <laughs> exactly. Do it this way. So, yeah, now I'm paying attention. Yeah, let's right. talk about it because it's possible. I mean, this attitude of win-win, the thing is that we have very much ingrained two ideas that we need to really work against them. One idea is that we can control nature. Right. <laughs> we are here to tame this thing, you know? And we are already understanding that that is not the correct approach. We are not here to tame anything. What we need to do is, is to be here to adapt and integrate to it, you know? So that is one idea. And the other idea is that I need to win. And for that, you need to lose. Right. Right. And that's no other way around it. And we need to find win-win situations, you know? Yeah. For everybody. Yeah. 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 Including the non-human creators that sustain the life of this planet oh 100 percent. and like you know we sometimes forget how connected we all are but you know even and it's and it's a difficult concept right sometimes to grasp because you're like well you know when there's biodiversity there's less disease and we can walk through that process but it's going to take really long and you're going to get really bored so just <laughs> you know what i mean like there's, there's yes. a really big distance yes. here sometimes but yeah it's, it's i mean it's hard to understand a complex system for sure but yeah. but the core idea in my mind is that this biodiversity that we are talking about, this saving the species narrative, is because that biodiversity is a sustaining foundation of everything else that we consider living. Yeah. And the air and the water and all these common ecosystem services that we talk about. If we don't have biodiversity, we don't have those, you know? Yeah. If we don't have bats... Just to say an example, if we don't have a healthy community of bats in southern Texas, yeah. all the orchards and all the agriculture, it will be consumed by pests Yeah, that bats, bats help prevent. The connections are very direct sometimes, but the costs are also perceived as direct, and nobody wants to participate in that. But the win-win situation is what we need to aim for. When I come to a project, I need to understand how can I bring value to the client, right? Yeah. How can my client achieve their goals integrating this perspective? 100%. How yeah. can I reduce risk, reduce cost? How can I position the branding? How can I create a narrative? How can I approach the regulations? How can, how can I support that? in a win-win situation, you know? Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a great, great point. And uh, I know we're getting close to the end of our time here, which really stinks because we could, I could keep talking about this forever. Um, <laughs> As you can see me too. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, before we let you go, I want to ask, um, we do a, a segment on the show called Field Notes where we, <laughs> we ask our guests to talk about memorable moments they've had in the field. And we're also encouraging our listeners to share those stories with us with hashtag field notes so that we can read them on a future episode. But if I had to give you just a story to close us out with about you being in the field, whether it's dangerous or funny, whatever it is. Can you give oh, me man, I, I, have so, I have so many of those. I know, you know, I know it's unfair. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many of those, um, which is fantastic because we can get to laugh in the field and and say, whoa, that was close. Yeah, <laughs> you <know>? yeah. <laughs> Probably one, one of them, I was doing a work in Belize. Mm -hmm. And we were, I was leading this amazing team of different disciplines of scientists. And there were ornithologists and, and mastozoologists and marine biologists. And, and this place, it was relatively remote. We needed to camp over there and we will camp for one week or sometimes two weeks in a place where water needed to come or capture from the rain. And oh, so it was quite intense after two weeks of not taking a proper shower. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and, and cooking in a, in a, I mean, it was, it was a condition, right? It was a remote yeah. place and, and it was full of crabs. It was full of blue crabs, but full means that sometimes you will have dinner and then with your headlamp, you will turn around and you will see thousands of crabs. Whoa. You know, yeah. literally thousands of crabs just waiting for you to drop something of what you were eating, <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> oh gosh. And one day, some of my friends and these guys, one of them, it was exhausted and he just uh, lay down in a, in a mat and fell asleep. Mm -hmm. And we kind of kept going. I mean, we were doing also bat and bird monitoring. So they were using some uh, nets to capture and release and all this. Yeah, yeah. And we kind of forgot. We, we will be working late in night and very early in the morning. And this guy wake up because the crabs were coming to him to see if he was dead and he was edible already, <laughs> you know? And they were yeah. pinching just to say like, okay, can I eat this already or not? Because crabs <laughs> are omnivorous, you know? Oh, they yeah. will eat everything. Everything, yeah. <laughs> so they were coming to him just saying, okay, is he ripe? No, but he was yeah. surrounded by thousands of crabs and he was like, oh my God! <laughs> he, he started shouting and running and then all the crabs, of course, run away and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and we were just laughing so hard, you know, but... But yeah, if you if you don't pay attention, the crabs will take you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was really fun. Yeah, well, that's, it was a that's great, a great life work. lesson right there. If you don't pay attention, <laughs> the crabs will take you. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it was oh, fun. Man. But I mean, the yeah. field working in the field is fantastic. Oh, and yeah. I said before, it's also dangerous. I mean, <laughs> yeah. working in the field, I have friends with all kind of experiences of tropical diseases and. I won't yeah. gross you out, but there's a lot of <laughs> things over there, you know. Yeah, that's uh, EPR after dark. We'll do a different. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. More stories. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to talk to you guys, and thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, of course, of course. And before we let you go, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Anything else you'd like to leave us with? Well, the only thing that I would say is that as a group of people that are concerned of the environment and where we are in that regard right now, I think that it's very important to take to heart that we are the ones that we are waiting for to arrive and do something about it. Right. There's no hero coming from anywhere else. Exactly. This is what we have, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And good, bad, <laughs> limited. I mean, yeah, that we are limited, but it's us. It's all of us. Mm -hmm. And we really need to step up and say, every time we have the opportunity to be as keen, as smart, and as possible to say, can I say something? Right. Can we consider this other direction because of this? Ben I mean, we need to do our homework and really step up. And you guys are doing it through this vehicle, which is fantastic. But I mean, that's my thing. Everybody yeah. should be doing something about it, you know? A hundred percent. And it's a great message to leave on. And in case people want to get in touch with you and ask you anything about that, um, yes. where can they reach you? I am in LinkedIn. You can reach me through there. And also in my, I mean, I, over there is my Jacobs email as well. Juan.Rovalo at Jacobs.com. We will be more than happy to talk about opportunities and possibilities and doing things together. That's what keep me up in the morning every day, you know, right. and at night sometimes. And, and that's what we do. So. Thank you very much again and keep on doing this work. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Nick. That's our show. Thank you, Juan, for joining us today. Please be sure to check us out each and every Friday. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Bye. See you, everybody. <laughs>